uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano to talk about all sorts of things. Judge, you right. know uh, mm -hmm. Bill Binney, William Binney, former NSA official, the architect of the NSA surveillance program. Yes. He says that the person, as it turns out, despite what the DNC and uh, Democrats are saying, it was not Russia that hacked the DNC. Uh, it was perhaps an official, it was somebody from the NSA who was angry about the fact that she was using personal email server, which violated what is called gamma material, which is the most sensitive at the NSA. Do you believe that? I do believe it. And one of the reasons that there is so much anxiety, it's very interesting and it's probably going to become an issue in the campaign. One of the reasons there is so much anxiety about Mrs. Clinton from the intelligence community is the belief that some of the materials that she handled with such extreme carelessness, I'm using Jim Comey's mm -hmm. phrase, in my opinion it was criminal, but in the FBI director's opinion it was extreme carelessness, contained the names of American mm -hmm. undercover intelligence agents, some of whom are no longer with us. This is the belief of a lot of people in the intelligence community. If Mrs. Clinton does become president of the United States, she's going to have a lot of antipathy towards her by people in the intelligence community. This is the tip of the iceberg. Well, that wasn't in the report that, that people might have died because, her, because names were listed and sent, right? The correct. Correct. The FBI did not reveal that. The FBI never revealed the contents, and quite properly, because it's still classified. Sure. The FBI never revealed the contents of the 25 top secret, of which five were SAP, meaning even FBI agents didn't have the clearance to reveal them. So Bill uh, Binney mm -hmm. is saying of the 60,000 NSA agents and contractors, there's a critical mass who fear Mrs. Clinton's presidency right. and more likely than not hacked into the DNC so the and NSA leaked this. Got him. So this is, to this is a man you know well, Judge, yes. and he recently did an, a radio interview where he explained essentially that. Listen. If you had to just uh, estimate here as an analyst who your best guess, uh, who, who, what would be your best guess uh, for who the hacker is, who Lucifer 2 is? In this situation, I was thinking about uh, how many other people have this, this data and hacked into the DNC, as well as hacking into uh, Hillary's uh, server at home. I go back to a statement made by uh, Director Mueller of the FBI back in uh, 30th of March of 2011, and he said uh, he got together with the Department of Defense, and they created a technology database uh, where... <clears throat> uh, he, as a member of the FBI, could go in with one query and get all past emails and all future ones as they came in on a person. Now, what he's talking about is going into the NSA database. So that means that NSA and, the, and, and a number of other agencies in the U.S. government also have those emails. So what he's saying is there's this NSA database, and right. unbeknownst to us, because there's no oversight, the FBI, the CIA has access to it. Comey could have looked at Hillary's email if they had him, but then he'd open a whole can of worms. Right. Then, then he would be revealing that the NSA, in fact, does have everybody's emails, and, which and a lot of us a secret. Right. Which a lot of us believe. Which Bill Binney, a former NSA official who developed the software that the NSA uses, says they have, but which the NSA has never officially acknowledged. There would also be serious criminal violations if the FBI had unfettered access. To the NSA material. It, the FBI has to ask for it or get a search warrant for it. Did they ask? Did they get a search warrant for Mrs. Clinton's materials? Answer no. Well, it's unthinkable to think that they, if they, they could be the source of the leaked emails that cost Debbie Wasserman Schultz her job. I, would, I can't imagine the NSA feeding Julian Assange this information. Could you? Yes. And that's exactly. You think they would actually that, well, use that outlaw, that, 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 that door like that is criminal? That is exactly what Bill Benny is saying. And, and we would never do that. Well. It's not we. Welcome to my chambers. The hack on the Democratic National Committee, which exposed emails, continues to intrigue. The emails which were exposed by WikiLeaks revealed a very strong bias on the part of high officials in the Democratic Party for the candidacy of Hillary Clinton and a very strong prejudice on the part of the same people towards the candidacy of Bernie Sanders. Even though such bias and prejudice had been alleged by Sanders and denied by the Democratic National Committee. It even resulted in the resignation of the chair of the committee as a result of a unanimous request from the members of the committee and the intervention of President Obama himself. 
that in order to get this issue off the front page, the DNC and the Clinton campaign decided to blame, of all people, the Russians. They accused Vladimir Putin of being in cahoots with Donald Trump and having his intelligence services hack the DNC to expose emails to make Mrs. Clinton look bad and thereby benefit Donald Trump. But the Russians had nothing to do with it because this week, a 30-year veteran of the National Security Administration, the NSA, the domestic spies who spy on all of us all the time, the former high-ranking NSA official who developed the software that the NSA now uses, which allows it to capture not just metadata, but content of every telephone call, text message, email in the United States of every person in the United States of America. This individual said, guess what? The NSA hacked the Democratic National Committee. Why would the NSA hack the DNC? Because the members of the intelligence community simply do not want Hillary Clinton to be president of the United States because she doesn't know how to handle state secrets. Because some of the state secrets that she revealed use the proper true names of American intelligence agents operating undercover in the Middle East. When they lost their covers, they ran for their lives and some of them didn't run fast enough and lost their lives. It's very telling that the intelligence community would feel so strongly about Mrs. Clinton that they would attempt to sabotage her campaign to prevent her from becoming their boss. It's also telling that these folks would break American law in order to, in their view, save it. Welcome to my channels. Fight the good fight. Hello world we are anonymous. With the recent talk of Russia being behind the DNC hacks. I thought I would add a little information to what is going on and why it seems we have various sides to this blame game of who did what. But what most don't know is that we have a war going on inside our intelligence agencies of the CIA and NSA to be the only intelligence agency. And with the election and all that has happened you can see whose side most of the players are on. If you go back to the Bush's history with George H.W. Bush as CIA director from February 26, 1953, November 29, 1961 Alan W. Dulles was director of the CIA early in 1933, Dulles attended a meeting in Germany where German industrialists agreed to back Hitler's bid for power in exchange for his pledge to break the German unions. A few months later, John Foster Dulles negotiated a deal with Hitler's economics minister whereby all German trade with the United States would be coordinated through a syndicate headed by Avril Harriman's cousin. With the Nazis enforcing a favorable climate for business, the profits for the Sin and other companies soared, and the Union Banking Corporation increasingly became a Nazi money laundering machine. In 1934, George Herbert Walker III placed Prescott Bush on Union Bank's board of directors, and Bush and Harriman also began to use the bank as the basis for a complex and deceptive system of holding companies. The Hamburg America shipping line, which Harriman and Walker had controlled since 1920, had a particularly high degree of Nazi involvement in its operations. In 1934, a congressional investigation revealed it to have become a front for IG Farben's spying propaganda, and bribery on behalf of the German government. Rather than advising Walker and Harriman to divest themselves of these tainted assets, Prescott Bush hired Alan Dulles to help conceal them. And let's not forget what happened to Kennedy after saying he would splinter the CIA into a thousand pieces and after Kennedy's death and the cover-up that followed. Lyndon B. Johnson took presidency. LBJ told both his mistress and his ex-wife about the assassination, the night before Kennedy was killed. After JFK's assassination Mrs. Kennedy refused to remove her blood-stained clothing, and regretted having washed the blood off her face and hands. As she stood next to Johnson on board the plane when he took the oath of office as president. She said, I want them to see what they have done to Jack. Jackie Kennedy believed LBJ was involved in her husband's murder. Jackie Kennedy, who died in 1994, states in her oral history recordings, that she made after the assassination, that it's very clear to her that others were involved, including President Lyndon Johnson. 
Then after LBJ's run at things Richard Nixon took his turn and Nixon little known to most Americans, Prescott Bush, George Bush's grandfather was Nixon's top financier from Wall Street. The Nixon campaign was funded by big eastern financial interests, the Bank of America, the big private utilities, the major oil companies. In 1969, one of Nixon's first actions as president was to send a jet at taxpayers' cost to pick up young George W. Baby Bush back to the White House for a date with his 23-year-old daughter Tricia, while he and Poppy H. W. Bush, an outsider to Washington politics chatted about the future. This would not be the only time that Nixon would bestow special favors upon the Bush family. Two years later Nixon would make George H. W. Bush ambassador to the United Nations and then chairman of the entire Republican Party, giving him the highest level of national political power. Bush became a crucial link to an alliance that was forming between Eastern bankers, Texas oil men, and intelligence operatives. The Bushes backed Nixon passionately in his 1960 presidential campaign against John F. Kennedy. Decades before George H. W. Bush was named CIA director, he was already involved with CIA covert operations, and even photographed outside the Dallas School Book Depository in Dallas, Texas after Kennedy's assassination. Many have come forward detailing the connections between the Bush family network and the ultimate elimination of the president of the free world, in order to begin what George W. Bush fully installed post-9-11 upon our planet Earth. Prescott Bush was betrayed by John Kennedy when he fired his best friend Alan Dulles as CIA director and tried to disrupt the financial grasp of the New York Federal Reserve System over the United States with Executive Order No. 11110. Then George H. W. Bush became CIA director. And the presidency from March 9, 1977, January 20, 1981 was Jimmy Carter. Bush first met with Carter to discuss ground rules on July 5 in Hershey, Pennsylvania. After Carter was officially nominated, Bush presided over more detailed briefings. The CIA's briefings for Carter were aimed at helping him understand the workings of the IC, as well as to process the classified information he was being given. The CIA briefings placed Carter on more equal footing with Ford when discussing foreign affairs during the presidential debates. Carter was so pleased that he even considered keeping Bush on as DCI if he was elected. So Bush helped Carter to win the election. But Bush offered his resignation. A final briefing between the two occurred on November 19, when Bush described more than 10 sensitive programs being run by the CIA and even mentioned staying on as director. Carter was notably quiet. He later shut down many of these programs and accepted Bush's resignation on January 10, 1977, the day of the presidential inauguration. The reason for this very obvious just from a quote by Carter. If I had agreed to let Bush remain DCI, he never would have become president. His career would have gone off on a whole different track. William J. Casey became CIA director January 28, 1981. January 29, 1987 Casey is most known for his, in economics and his independent ties to Nixon. He is credited with luring James A. Baker, later Secretary of State under Bush, he played a murky role in the Iran-Contra affair, President Ronald Reagan's greatest foreign policy debacle. The shooting of Ronald Reagan on March 30, 1981, a deranged young man attempted to assassinate U.S. President Ronald Reagan. Just another gun nut, acting on his own? Or was there something more to Reagan's shooting? Hinckley had been a mind-controlled fall guy for the CIA. The agency, wanted their former boss and Reagan's own Vice President George Herbert Walker Bush, father of the current president, George W. Bush in the White House instead of the The Jipper, as Reagan was fondly known to many. Bush, like his son, was and is a member of the ultra-secretive Skull and Bones Society of Yale. What is known about this society is that its initiation rituals for new members involve lying naked in a coffin and providing fellow members information they could use for blackmail against them, ensuring their loyalty to the creepy but powerful club. It is also known that Skull and Bones tends to be a place where the equally creepy CIA recruits many of its high-ranking members. 
there is evidence to suggest Bush worked for the CIA as early as 1961. Bush, then a wealthy Texas oil man in his late 30s, visited oil rigs around the world. Was this the perfect cover for a CIA spy? Bush's oil company was named Zapata also the codename for the CIA's ill-fated Bay of Pigs invasion of Castro's Cuba in 1961. Two of the U.S. Navy ships that were repainted to look like civilian ships for the invasion were named Barbara and Houston, the name of Bush's wife and adopted hometown. The U.S. government released 100,000 pages of old documents related to the President John F. Kennedy assassination in 1978. A memo in that mountain of information was sent by the State Department to George Bush of the Central Intelligence Agency. The memo wrote of the possibility of another attempted invasion of Cuba following JFK's death in 1963. Some point to this as another link in the chain of Bush's involvement with the CIA long before he was officially the agency's director. Must have been another George Bush, a Bush presidential campaign team member lamely replied when questioned about this in 1980. There was indeed a George William Bush who worked for the CIA, but only for a few months as a low-ranking office worker in 1964. When tracked down by an investigative journalist about the memo, the former agency employee replied he was never consulted in any way by the State Department, the FBI, or any other government body regarding an invasion of Cuba. You must mean President Bush, he said. George de Morinskild, a Russian-born wealthy Texas oil man who had links to alleged JFK assassin Lee Harvey Oswald, was called to appear before the House Select Committee on Assassinations in 1978 regarding the JFK killing and his ties to Oswald. The oil man never made it. He was found dead after an apparent suicide and in his personal address book investigators found the name Bush, George H. W. 1412 W. Ohio also Zapata Petroleum Midland. John Hinckley had flown from Nebraska to Nashville in October 1980 with plans to assassinate President Jimmy Carter, but Nashville airport officials detained him when it was found he had three guns in his luggage. Amazingly, he was released with a fine after a mere five hours in detention, in a city where President Carter was expected. Hinckley also had links with the American Nazi Party and the Islamic guerrilla army. A member of the latter group apparently warned the Secret Service of Hinckley's plan to shoot Reagan two months before the shooting, but did nothing about it. Even more amazingly, the Bush and Hinckley families were old friends. Both families had made a fortune in the Texas oil industry. Bush's son Neil even had plans to meet with Hinckley's brother Scott the same evening Reagan was shot. Then after Reagan. George H. W. Bush became president from 1991 to 1993 then Bill Clinton. And the Clinton family have been heavily involved in the trafficking of drugs, both inside and outside of the United States which was actually part of the Iran-Contra scandal during the 1980s. Back then Bill Clinton was the governor of Arkansas which was the home of the MENA airport, a major pickup and drop-off location for drug shipments handled by the CIA. In fact, it is estimated by U.S. Customs that at least 75% of all drug smuggling aircraft have passed through this area. The famous drug smuggler Barry Seal was one of the pilots in this operation and claims he trafficked several billion dollars worth of drugs in just three years of working for the CIA before getting caught. He was able to get a plea deal and intended to turn state witness against bigger names within the drug smuggling operation, which some people believe included Clinton. Before Seal could ever implicate any higher-ups though, he was found murdered in his car. Then Governor Bill Clinton has been accused of being a major player in the MENA, Arkansas air-based drug trafficking operation. Perhaps most credible of these accusers, is CIA whistleblower Terry Reid who has since written a book detailing just exactly how the CIA, in partnership with Bill Clinton, smuggled drugs into Arkansas. More than just being accused though, Bill Clinton's administration while governor of Arkansas, clearly suppressed investigations and when independent journalists tried to bring the truth to light through the news media. Mainstream media publication Time magazine, which was founded by Henry Luce, a Skull and Bones member, were part of that cover-up as well. Terry Reid was wrongfully dragged into a lengthy legal battle with the government because he began to speak out, 
which he eventually managed to overcome and be vindicated of. Being a fighter, this is also what inspired Reed to release his groundbreaking book which exposes the involvement of both Bill Clinton and George Bush Sr. in the drug trade. So we have the Bush family and the Clinton family working together and I think we all know about Obama being close to both the Bushes and Clintons. Hillary Clinton in Chappaqua uh, preparing uh, and uh, Donald Trump is getting ready for their showdown here at Hofstra University, which is where we are. Uh, hello again, everyone. I'm Frederica Whitfield here at Hofstra University, which uh, will be uh, the stage set for presidential debate in two days. But there, as people are enjoying photographs there at the historical uh, landmark now of the Smithsonian Museum. And that brings me to the war between intelligence agencies. Now the NSA hacked the DNC because of the mission dealing of secrets by Hillary that got people in the field killed. Her ties to the CIA Bush dynasty. And the NSA knew if Hillary became the next president that the NSA would face large budget cuts. Now what I tell you is my opinion and not fact. There is a chance Snowden is NSA and the NSA have never been looking to bring him in he is working with Russia to help bring down the CIA. I have a good idea that Russia is like most of the countries that the CIA has caused major problems for and would like some payback. I just find it hard to accept that Snowden was able to steal from an intelligence agency like the NSA. The NSA one of the most advanced spying agencies ever. An agency that can find a laptop in a blizzard or watch and hear anyone they feel like. But Snowden downloaded and managed to walk out with secrets. But yet the only thing that we ever heard that he leaked was what everyone already knew and that was the NSA was spying on everyone. But until we remove those that commit the crimes and all that have ties to them America will continue to spiral out of control. But then again was America ever in control and by America I mean its people. In a speech before the CIA celebrating its 50th anniversary, President Clinton said, by necessity, the American people will never know the full story of your courage. Clinton's is a common defense of the CIA, namely, the American people should stop criticizing the CIA because they don't know what it really does. This, of course, is the heart of the problem in the first place. An agency that is above criticism is also above moral behavior and reform. Its secrecy and lack of accountability allows its corruption to grow unchecked. Furthermore, Clinton's statement is simply untrue. The history of the agency is growing painfully clear, especially with the declassification of historical CIA documents. We may not know the details of specific operations, but we do know, quite well, the general behavior of the CIA. These facts began emerging nearly two decades ago at an ever-quickening pace. Today we have a remarkably accurate and consistent picture, repeated in country after country, and verified from countless different directions. The CIA's response to this growing knowledge and criticism follows a typical historical pattern. Indeed, there are remarkable parallels to the medieval church's fight against the scientific revolution. The first journalists and writers to reveal the CIA's criminal behavior were harassed and censored if they were American writers, and tortured and murdered if they were foreigners. See Philip Agee's on the run for an example of early harassment. However, over the last two decades the tide of evidence has become overwhelming, and the CIA has found that it does not have enough fingers to plug every hole in the dike. This is especially true in the age of the Internet, where information flows freely among millions of people. Since censorship is impossible, the agency must now defend itself with apologetics. Clinton's Americans Will Never Know Defense is a prime example. Another common apologetic is that the world is filled with unsavory characters, and we must deal with them if we are to protect American interests at all. There are two things wrong with this. First, it ignores the fact that the CIA has regularly spurned alliances with defenders of democracy, free speech, and human rights, preferring the company of military dictators and tyrants. The CIA had moral options available to them, but did not take them. Second, this argument begs several questions. The first is, which American interests? 
The CIA has courted right-wing dictators because they allow wealthy Americans to exploit the country's cheap labor and resources. But poor and middle-class Americans pay the price whenever they fight the wars that stem from CIA actions, from Vietnam to the Gulf War to Panama. The second big question is, why should American interests come at the expense of other people's human rights? The CIA should be abolished, its leadership dismissed and its relevant members tried for crimes against humanity. Our intelligence community should be rebuilt from the ground up, with the goal of collecting and analyzing information. As for covert action, there are two moral options. The first one is to eliminate covert action completely. But this gives jitters to people worried about the Adolf Hitlers of the world. So a second option is that we can place covert action under extensive and true democratic oversight. For example, a bipartisan congressional committee of 40 members could review and veto all aspects of CIA operations upon a majority or supermajority vote. Which of these two options is best may be the subject of debate, but one thing is clear, like dictatorship, like monarchy, unaccountable covert operations should die like the dinosaurs they are. The thing people don't realize is that the CIA is the only intelligence organization that is not dependent upon defense spending for its funding, therefore, it has nothing to gain by pumping up estimates of enemy danger in order to preserve or increase its funding. We are anonymous. We do not forgive. We do not forget. Expect us. Good evening. Since 1990, the League of Lady Conspiracists has been giving advice to the public on simple measures by which the increasing menace of mind control, already so prevalent in today's society, may be thwarted. It gives me great pleasure, therefore, to present to you today the founder of the League, Miss Sylvia Stankertz, singing for us a song which offers stage advice to the worried citizen. Sylvia's mother... Is you know Michelle is a trend. I'm sorry, she's a what? A transgender. We all know. Oh my gosh. Emmeline Stankert will accompany on the piano forte. <laughs> <laughs> 